performance webinar series. Uh, my name is Eric Janesco. I'm the head coach and CEO of Maximum Acceleration, the professional's coaching company. And we started this series about about two and a half years ago to just bring together a community of learning and, and growth, people in the mortgage business who are dedicated to in, improving and refining their, their skills and abilities to, to grow their business faster. And today's event uh, is a uh, back by popular demand type of event uh, that we're really excited to bring you. Um, as a result, uh, we've but have been able to bring some really great programs and speakers. And one of the top rated programs of the entire series so far has been Mr. James Charlotte. And so he is back by popular demand today to share with us some key information about how to win the credit scoring game. I mean, let's be honest, uh, we all know that the credit score is a fundamental responsibility in managing getting a borrower alone and in many cases can be worth hundreds of dollars if not thousands of dollars in cost by just a few differences in points on a credit score and so uh, being an expert at credit and how to better manage credit behavior is a critical element of becoming an effective originator in in today's world but we also have to recognize, understand, and appreciate that there's a responsibility that comes along with it. I and mean, we're not talking the gross manipulation and misrepresentations of the credit repair of the former years. What we are talking about is how to help legally, ethically, and responsibly help coach clients on how to better manage their credit behaviors and how to uh, eliminate or remove information that is erroneously and, and in many cases abusively being misreported and miscoded by you know unscrupulous actors and, and third-party collection companies that are on purpose uh, ne over aggressively negatively impacting a borrower's credit score. Obviously we are not talking about trying to omit information that is relevant to a borrower's ability to repay a loan which would in essence constitute loan fraud. But we are talking about how to help you really become the export, the trusted resource, and how to coach your clients on what it really is going to take to get them the loans that they so dearly desire. So without further ado, I want to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. James Charlotte. Uh, he is, is the recognized expert in the field of credit repair. He's become a great friend over the years. I'll tell you what, I learned more listening to him for 45 minutes than I did in a two-day workshop that was put on by Equifax back in 2009. Um, so I know there's a wealth of information to share with you, and I know you're going to get a lot of value out of today's program. So without further ado, James, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm glad everybody could uh, make it today. I actually almost didn't make it myself. I got apparently confused Eastern and Central time, so <laughs> I had Eric a little bit worried that I wasn't going to make it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, for those that haven't seen me or heard me before, I'll tell you a little bit about my background and how I got into credit to begin with. Uh, I was a uh, legal and compliance executive at Experian. Usually when I'm speaking for NAM, that's where people start throwing tomatoes. But I'm not with Experian anymore. I'll tell you what I did for them. Uh, when Experian would be sued in federal court, I was one of those uh, lucky, unlucky individuals that had to go and testify for them and uh, also represented them uh, on the Hill and uh, with FTC and with uh, attorney generals. And uh, when you do that long enough, what you start to see is a pattern. You know, every day at Experian, we would get sued five times a day. We would get 250 legitimate threats of lawsuit, 80 AG complete, uh, complaints, 80 BBB complaints, 25 to 30 UCC complaints, uh, 10 congressional inquiries. And, and I just realized that, you know, for every one of those people that had the knowledge, the resources, the wherewithal to go to their congressman, to go to, uh, to hire an attorney to sue us, how many other hundreds or, or thousands of people had errors on their reports and uh, no way to really uh, get satisfaction on those. They were hitting the red tape that uh, is unfortunately common in that industry. And so that's what led me to go into credit. Uh, you know, obviously probably a lot of people here uh, know the nightmare and the horror stories that have come from credit repair, unfortunately. You know, when I was experienced, I was taught to hate credit repair. Uh, I shut down credit repair companies. I worked with the Justice Department and found people doing terrible things, creating false profiles under false social security numbers and forging police reports, believe it or not, and a lot of other terrible things. And, uh, you know, I came into credit services with the thought that maybe I could do something to improve both industries, the credit reporting and the credit repair industries. Um, so that leads me to the next part, which is the education. And the first thing I, I, I like to talk about, uh, especially when we're talking about coaching and, and helping you to be better for your clients, is what we're really trying to do here, and that's to correct errors. Credit repair uh, 
in a lot of cases, unfortunately, is lying. It, it's saying an account is not yours when it really is yours. It's saying an account was never late when, wow, you were really, really late. And that's illegal. The Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is one of the primary laws that we work under, that's uh, one of the laws that I was certified as a federal witness to testify under, uh, it, it says that you can't make misrepresentation to a credit, a credit reporting company. You can't lie about what uh, you've done. Uh, you can't, if an account doesn't have any actual errors uh, in the way that it's reported, you're not supposed to investigate it. Unfortunately, what we've found, and uh, I'll talk in a minute about uh, who else has found this besides us, what we found is that there is a multitude of information, particularly on potentially negative accounts, uh, that is misreported. I'm sorry, I want to interject something else really, really quick. Uh, Eric said it, but I want to reemphasize. You've got that question and answer bar up there. If I say anything, if I throw out an acronym, if, I, uh, if there's something that I say uh, that you have a question about or something that you should have a question about in credit in general, throw it up in that q and I've got uh, a couple of my business development specialists in here. Uh, Gordon Meek and uh, Yolanda Martinez are both here. They're going to be uh, relaying questions to me and, and answering them. So please, whatever, you, whatever questions you've got, uh, please uh, ask them and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, but back to the information and the presentation. Um, so how many errors are there actually on a credit report? So back in 2013, there was a series of four studies that came out all in a row. Uh, the first one that came out was from an organization called the CDIA. Uh, that's the uh, Consumer Data Industry uh, Association, and it is the trade organization that represents uh, all consumer data industries, so credit reporting agencies, apartment renting agencies, uh, banking like check systems, uh, background checks, uh, employment screening, all of those are represented by the CDIA. However, credit uh, reporting agencies, as you can imagine, are their largest clients. Uh, and they came out with a study on a Friday saying that 2.5% of all the information in credit reports was reported inaccurately. Even if that was the truth, which it's not, that would still be millions of Americans that they're acknowledging that have errors on their reports. But the reason they came out with their study was that 60 Minutes was doing a profile on credit reporting agencies that was, let's say, less than flattering. Uh, that came out on Sunday. And in that, 60 Minutes uh, claimed through their investigation that 45% of all the data contained in credit reports was reported inaccurately. The next day, the FTC came out with their two-year study that said the exact same thing that the 60 Minutes uh, expose said. And then to kind of put the cherry on top of that horrible, horrible Sunday, uh, the next day, the National Consumer Law Center, a group headed by <laughs> Chi Chi Wu, who is a great consumer advocate uh, on Capitol Hill, came out with a study showing that 82% of all credit reports have an error substantial enough to cause a reduction in a consumer's ability to borrow. So we are not talking about one in a thousand customers with some little error. This is a huge, huge problem that consumer advocates have been screaming about for a long time, and those consumers that are being negatively impacted by that misinformation is who we're trying to help to correct that information. Uh, because really, when it comes down to it, that credit score, that three-digit number that defines your borrower, what that is is taking the raw data in a credit report and turning it into that number. So if that data is incorrect, then you're not getting the correct score. Then what the risk is for that person is being misrepresented to you. And what our goal is, and what your goal would be as a credit coach in helping your consumers, uh, your clients, I, I sometimes I revert back to that Experian language where my clients at Experian were Bank of America and American Express and NCO. You were just a consumer. The people that paid our bills were the banks and the finance companies and the collection companies. Those were our clients. Those were our customers. Everybody else was just a consumer. So sometimes I revert back to that. But trying to help your client, what you're trying to do is get them to be the most accurate representation of risk. We don't want to misrepresent the risk. We don't want to make, make someone that truly doesn't pay their bills make them look like they do. You, you certainly would not want to lend money to that person, and I wouldn't want you to. What we're trying to do is, as credit coaches, as credit service companies, is to present the consumer in the most accurate light that we possibly can. So with that said, I'm going to advance to some of these slides here. I think I kind of covered the first one. So we talked about this. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me cover a couple of these points that are on this slide real quick here. Uh, so we covered correction and proper scores. Uh, speaking of that, a lot of your consumers, and this is kind of uh, what we get into a lot in our, our, our longer coaching sessions, uh, 
has to do with you know some of the more of the minutia and the nitty gritty of, of the smaller codes and what goes into all the algorithms. But just dispelling some of the myths and misconceptions as well, and this is one of the main ones. You know, I believe if you ask most consumers on the street how many uh, different credit scores they have, uh, I bet you a lot of them would tell you one. And if they're really savvy, they might say, well, there's three credit reporting agencies. I have three scores. And in fact, even when I'm, I'm at NAM and I'm, or uh, NAMB and I'm, I'm lecturing in front of, you know, sometimes hundreds of mortgage professionals, I'll ask this question and, you know, show of hands, show me how many, and I see hundreds of, of originators holding up three fingers. You've got three scores. That's not the answer. The answer is thousands. You have thousands of different credit scores. Every consumer does. You've got, I mean, Fair Isaac Corporation alone has 24 different scoring models across four different generations that they're currently selling. Each one of those scoring algorithms can then be changed to a specific industry. Uh, so, for example, you can have a Fair Isaac Classic 04 with an auto enhancement or a Fair Isaac Classic 04 with a real estate enhancement or an insurance enhancement. And then couple that with each bank can then have it for themselves. So, for example, Capital One is, is very, very, very big on uh, customer loyalty. And so they will put heavier weight on your payment history with their bank. So that for a Capital One Fair Isaac Classic 04 auto enhancement, if you have a couple good accounts with Capital One that you have these payments on, you'll have a higher score on that same day with the same report with Capital One than you would with Wells Fargo. So there are, it can be a huge, huge difference in those scores as well with the, with the bank enhancements and with the industry enhancements. So again, you know, the answer there is thousands of credit scores. And then the last, uh, this is just kind of a, a neat little fact. What a credit score is, is a mathematical algorithm made up of all of the smaller algorithms. So when you look at your mortgage report, you see a credit score with the model, the scoring model they used, and the credit reporting agency they used to put into that scoring algorithm, and then you see four codes. Well, federal law requires they put those four codes there if you're not perfect. So on a standard Fair Isaac model, it goes 300 to 850. 850 would be a perfect score. So if you're not an 850, they have to tell you in order of how heavily they're weighted against that score, the top four reasons why you're not an 850. So when you're looking at those, you can actually look and say, well, the number one reason that you're not a, don't have a perfect credit score is this, and the number two is this. But here's the real kicker. All of those algorithms come together to form a bell curve algorithm, where, in theory, every single American is laid out on a bell curve in order based on where they are. So everyone, you know, with a standard deviation along the bell curve that terminates at both ends. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? How many people on a standard Fair Isaac 300 to 850 model have an 850, and how many have a 300? The answer, one. In theory, at any given point in time, only one person in America has an 850, and only one has a 300. In fact, you might have noticed on a lot of your more recent reports that instead of going from 300 to 850, you'll see it go from 392 to 824. What they've done there is take the top 0.1% and give all of them an 824. So that range only goes to 824 instead of 850 because the actual mathematical algorithm would only have one person at both ends. That's why they're, they're cutting those off and truncating them so they don't have to explain those top four reasons for as many people that said change the range. They didn't actually change the algorithm, just the range of the scores. Okay? So let's move on from there. Real quick before I move on to this next slide, we have any, oh, you guys handling the questions up there? Is there any of them that I, do you think would be good to go on here? Um, well, I'm curious. Michelle was asking um, about how if there's a way that uh, we could get them to stop the BK reporting um, with the current reporting date. I'd be curious to see that. So, it, so the, I'm sorry. Let me see the question. It, it, it says, how can a predator, How can she get a predator to stop well, reporting okay. that shop, uh, including a BK? with the current um, reporting date? Well, that is, that's certainly something that we would work on. Um, what you would have to do in that case, it would probably be easiest to get an actual copy of the bankruptcy paperwork. You would want schedules A through F and the uh, uh, notice of filing and the uh, notice of discharge of bankruptcy uh, and take all of that paperwork. Now, depending on who your credit bureau is, and here's another one of those myths and misconceptions, credit reporting agencies, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion are not bureaus. They are credit reporting agencies or credit repositories. 
The bureaus are the third-party companies like CoreLogic, Core Factual Data, CBC I know is, that resell that, those reports to mortgage companies and automobile dealerships. So depending on which bureau that you use to pull your reports from, they probably have a rapid rescore system. The proper way to report an account, and obviously there's a little bit of a difference between a Chapter 7, a Chapter 12, and a Chapter 13, which are the only types of bankruptcies that should show up on a consumer credit report. Uh, but an account that's discharged through one of those bankruptcies, uh, for Chapter 7, it should have no late payment history after the file date of the bankruptcy. The status should be discharged through Chapter 7, and the balance should be zero. Theoretically, depending on what, which bureau you're using, you can take that paperwork that I just mentioned and rapid rescore that account to have the proper date. If your bureau won't do it, with that paperwork, all three credit reporting agencies would update that trade line to show, but you'd have to send that all of that paperwork to all three credit reporting agencies separately to make sure that those dates were correct. Uh, and uh, but that 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 would be the best way for Chapter uh, 12. Exact same process as the Chapter 7. For Chapter 13, it's a little bit different. Chapter 13 on the credit reporting agency side, if it is a discharge bankruptcy, and by the way, folks. Uh, Chapter 13 now is the most common kind of bankruptcy. However, it is also the least likely to succeed. Less than one in five Chapter 13s will discharge. Over 80% of them get dismissed out of court. Uh, but if, you, it is, if it is a discharge Chapter 13, the trade lines included in that bankruptcy should actually show no late payment history ever. Even if it was a charge-off when it went into the Chapter 13, discharging a Chapter 13 erases the negative payment history from that trade line. So every account discharged to Chapter 13, proper reporting at the credit reporting agency side, should stay discharged to Chapter 13 bankruptcy, never late, zero balance. Okay? And uh, again, with those schedules A through F, the discharge of bankruptcy and the notice of filing, uh, you should be, be able to either rapid rescore or at the very least go through the normal dispute process with the credit reporting agency to get that uh, rectified. Uh, all right, so now we're going to move on to uh, uh, a little bit more. This is this is something, and this is something that, again, if, if you're in the, the five-hour coaching class that Eric and I put on here for a credit coach, we go into the risk and the gray area in uh, a, a lot more detail. I'm going to touch on it right now because I do think it's, uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation about uh, uh, credit reporting and credit scoring and, and uh, out there and Having these two tools, understanding these two concepts, gives you a really good filter to be able to stop some of that incorrect information from coming to you. So first of all, risk. All three of the industries that we've mentioned, credit bureaus, credit uh, reporting agencies, credit scoring companies, they all exist for this word, for risk. What is the risk that your borrower will not repay the loan that was given to them? That's it. That's all these billions, billions of dollar industries. Experian alone is over a $4 billion company. <coughs> they exist to try and determine what this risk is. So what does that mean for dispelling the, the myths and misconceptions? It means that if you've heard something that is against risk and been told that something that's counterintuitive to risk goes into a scoring mechanism, you've probably been misinformed. Uh, one of the most common uh, things, and it's not listed here, but we'll talk about it in a little bit greater detail for our final point today. Um, paying a collection company. It comes down to simple, just again, just some common sense in this case. Are you more of a risk with a paid collection or are you more of a risk with an unpaid collection? Of course, you're more of a risk with an unpaid collection than you are with paid. There is no credit scoring algorithm. And I know you all, if you've been in the mortgage business long enough, you probably all have anecdotal evidence showing that someone paid a collection and their score dropped. But there is no credit scoring algorithm designed to punish someone for paying a collection. If you think about it, also, not even just risk, but one of the biggest revenue generators for credit reporting agencies are collection companies. If they were lowering your score for paying it because it updated the date, that would be disincentivizing consumers to pay one of their best customers. It doesn't work that way. I can guarantee you 100% every single time you've seen that happen, and I don't doubt for a second, a lot of you have seen it happen. But when they paid a collection, the score went down. It's not because the credit score was designed for that to happen. It's because the collection company did something mm -hmm. illegal. They put the paid date in the original date of delinquency field. They changed it from being a third-party collection company to an installment account or to an other account so that the open date for that account all of a sudden factored into the average open dates. 
There are so many things that they can do, and I'm not going to cast dispersions here and say whether they do it ignorantly or maliciously. You can make those assumptions for yourself. Nonetheless, I can promise you, every time you saw it happen where a score dropped, when they paid a collection, it was not because of the credit score. It was because of the collection company okay, that did something that was illegal and incorrect. And again, we're talking about something where we know that you know, half or better of the information in the reports is inaccurate. And this is just one of those examples. Another example of risk where there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of you might have heard the opt-in, opt-out program. That is a, uh, where you can choose to not receive the pre-approved offers in the mail. There is a pervasive myth that continues to this day online from supposed credit experts that says if you opt out of receiving prepaid offers, your scores are going to go up. And I have seen experts say anywhere from 5 to 35 points for opting out. Folks, that is a risk-neutral event. Not to mention, again, you have to also think about this from a business enterprise uh, perspective. Credit reporting agencies make money selling lists to creditors with your names on them. When you remove your name from those lists, you reduce their capacity to make revenue. Do you think they're going to reward you in your score for that? Whether it's risk or not, in this case, of course, they're not going to, A. But in this case, it's just, again, it's a risk neutral event. Same thing, so, and I think this ties in with opt-in, opt-out. I think somewhere along the way, they figured out that uh, opt-in, uh, or sorry, that uh, those pre-approved offers were an inquiry. And they said, oh, well, inquiries impact the score. They can input the score uh, quite a bit in some cases. So if I opt out and I don't get those inquiries, my score will go up. Well, no, those are soft inquiries. There are several different kinds of soft inquiries. Soft inquiries are sometimes also called inquiries viewable only by you. Those are inquiries that you would only see <laughs> on a consumer credit report. Okay? So you would only see them on the reports that you pull online. And by the way, pulling your own report online, that also would never impact your score. That also is a soft inquiry. Okay? Uh, authorized user accounts. I, I, I put this on here to kind of uh, contradict myself. <laughs> Uh, authorized user accounts are the one thing that, in my opinion, violates risk. It's the only instance where kind of the uh, exception proves the rule, I guess. There was a time a few years ago where they were trying to exclude authorized user accounts from the calculation of a credit score. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, unfortunately, the e well, fortunately or for unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the ECOA codes are so vital in the definition of an account that they just couldn't figure out a good way to exclude them. So although, and this is another, also another one of those misconceptions, underwriting and credit scoring don't always match up perfectly. This is one of those cases where authorized users, they're going to impact the credit score, sometimes very positively, sometimes negatively. But they're going to be factored into the credit score. However, in most cases, they are not going to count as one of the required trade lines that your borrower is going to need to get to home. So they're going to need other trade lines beyond those authorized users for underwriting. But from a risk perspective, even though technically they're not on the hook for them, they do still get factored in the credit score. So right as I tell you everything's risk, I tell you the one time where it's not. But nonetheless, authorized user accounts are still factored into scores. So risk is the, is the first part of that filter I was talking about. The second part is something that I call the gray area. This one requires just a little bit more explanation. So, as we said earlier, a credit score is a collection of smaller algorithms that come together to form that, that bigger equation, okay? But the kicker is, each one of those smaller equations impacts the other one. So, the number of trade lines that with balances uh, that you have also impacts uh, your uh, your uh, Utilization also impacts how you're impacted by the number of open accounts, also impacts how you're impacted by your average age of accounts. What that means is every nice little black and white answer you've ever been told that has a nice little bow on it, you know, nobody should have more than 10 accounts with balances. Nobody should have more than five consumer finance accounts open. Uh, everyone should have uh, at least two uh, major credit cards and uh, no department store cards. These are all things that have been presented as straight facts, okay? None of them are. Nothing that I just said is actually a fact. What they are, for, they would be for some people, but not for others. Maybe one of you has, uh, you know, 50, or 
probably not 50. They want to be has 30 years of good positive credit history. So the banks might trust you to have 20 accounts and balances on them before it starts to negatively impact you. Whereas one of the other people on here might only have two years of positive history, and you'd be negatively impacted by having six accounts with balances. It's going to be slightly different for everybody based on their unique credit report. Credit report's a fingerprint, and your score is going to be based on your fingerprint. Okay? That's part one of the gray area. Part two is a global gray area. Every credit score in America, every company that creates them, is constantly measuring our behavior. As a, as a, a society, we changed during the Great Recession. We changed during the dot-com boom. The way that we paid bills, the ways that we saved, what we spent our money on, uh, you know, whether it's unbanking people, whether it's moving away from credit cards, whether it's moving to credit cards, our behavior as a society is changing all the time, and they're trying to keep their finger on the pulse of that. So, and I'm going to tell you what we would do at Experian. We produce a score called Plus Score. We also are, are part owners of Vantage Score. And I say we, my pronoun, I'm not a spy for Experian, I promise. But <laughs> I still use those pronouns because you get in that habit when you're testifying for them. Um, but the way we would do it, every single day, we would take a sample of about 10,000 people. We wanted a valid sample set. Now, we wouldn't see their personal information, but we would see their credit report. And we would look for a commonality. So, for example, we would take 10,000 people that had a late payment on an automobile six months ago and see where are they now. Are they still late on that automobile? Did they catch up? Did they go more delinquent? Is it in repo? Did they go late on a house? Did they go late on a credit card? Did they get new collections? What's happened with those people after that event six months ago? And if one of those things was statistically significantly different than the last time we conducted the same study, then we would tweak the algorithm accordingly. So your customer that comes to you today had a late payment on their car six months ago, but they got caught up right away, haven't missed anything up. That's the only late payment they've ever had. They're 655, and they're good to go. No problems. Even though they've got that late payment, everything else works out. But today, we do that study, and we see that she's the exception to the rule, it seems. For those 10,000 people, on average, they're still delinquent. They're 95 points down on average. Most of those cars went in repo. Whatever it is, it's a big change, and we tweak the score. So when you pull that young lady's report, the very next day, she was a 655, now she's a 635, and your criteria is 640, and you can't lend to her even though nothing changed on a report. And real quick, even that, is that true? Does, did nothing change on a report? No, of course not. Just the passage of time has changed on your credit report. There's things that go into your score, time since most recent inquiry, time since most recent account opening, average age of accounts. There's things that go into your credit score that are based on time. Maybe yesterday, that young lady was four years, 11 months, and 29 days on average for the length of her account. But today, She's five years. That's a threshold number. Her score is going to go up just on the passage of that one day. So even if I say nothing changed on the report, it's talking about in a hypothetical vacuum because your report is changing. Rate. Also, it's worth noting the way the information gets to a credit reporting agency. Most people think that it's all electronic, that eOscar is used for that. There's not enough bandwidth in the country for the billions of trade lines that are being updated on, on a monthly basis. It is still being done by sequential data tape. If you sit in front of Experian's main processing facility in Allen, Texas, you'll see Loomis Fargo trucks pulling up all day long, every day. They're wheeling in tapes that have the updates for that month from banks and finance companies and creditors and credit card companies and collection companies, et cetera. What that also means, by the way, is there is no day that's more likely for them to update on. They, we got just as many tapes on the 13th as we got on the 27th as we got on the 1st or 15th. Every single day, trade lines are being updated at the credit reporting agencies, okay? So, last thing for this, for the gray area, the third part, everything that I'm teaching you, everything we're talking about is accurate today. It's, I stay very on top of the changes and the laws, and I get daily updates from uh, our, uh, the lobbying firm that works with credit and works with Maxine Waters and all the people that are on the House Financial Services Committee. So I'm, I'm very blessed with that. But that also means what I know and what you're about to know, I could, something I told, told you could change tomorrow. This stuff changes all the time. There's law, there's case law, there's state law, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a revolving door of the way things are interpreted and the way, <laughs> the way policies are made and the way 
that even judges in terms of, you know, you've had a couple really, really big lawsuits come through in the last few years uh, because of mixed files, something that used to be very much off the radar for uh, legal professionals is now something that, you know, Equifax is losing $19 million lawsuits for one person in Oregon. I mean, we had a whole floor of customer service reps devoted just to unmixing files. And one person is winning a $19 million lawsuit? I mean, this is, it's getting to be, like I said, things change all the time. Uh, and that's just the way that it is. So a couple other things on here, but we'll, uh, we're going to skip over those. That's something we'll we cover in a more in-depth class with more time than we've got today. So this is the last thing that I'm going to talk about before I start going back and answering some more questions here. I know we, we, we jumped in with one question. I think we've got quite a few up there, Gordon. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, so we'll go back and get those in just a second. I want to talk about this because it's a uh, really important concept, and I think this is probably Eric's favorite thing that I talk about as well. So ODD. I usually get blank stares when I say it. And, you know, like odd. Yeah, that's odd that you're saying ODD like that. Um, but actually, ODD is one of the most important and certainly the most litigated concept in all of credit reporting. Uh, you guys might know this already, but when laws pass, typically, we don't know how we're going to interpret them. Uh, you know, when FACTA passed, we're sitting down with Jones Day, that was our external counsel experience, and we're going through it, and we're like, well, what are we going to do with this? Nothing. Well, what are we going to do with this? Nothing. Well, why are we doing nothing with these parts of the law? Because we have no idea what con congressional intent was. All we, all we can do is wait until someone sues us on it and we get judicial interpretation, and then we'll change our policies accordingly. So, so sometimes you've got to have the law done that way. Well, ODD is one of those concepts that has been litigated in so many courts all across the country that it is a laser-focused definition that is the same across the board. And it's simply this. ODD is the first missed payment that leads to the most <laughs> negative status without becoming current again. Okay? ODD is also where the seven-year statute, the federal statute for how long negative information can stay on your credit report begins to run. Not at the date of charge-off, not at the date of collection. At the first missed payment, that first 30-day late payment that leads to that most negative status without being current again. Quite frankly, the, way it, the reason it's interpreted that way is because potentially negative information can only stay on the credit report for seven years. That past due balance that never gets current again, that balance is negative. Not just the trade line, the balance. So that means it can only be on the credit report for seven years. So what does that mean? Let's say you have a, late, a credit card with Chase, and your first missed payment was in May of 2008. Here we sit in March of, well, almost April, but March of 2015, and for whatever reason, Chase held that account until now. And today, they sell it to NCO. Now, when I do this in a format where I can actually see you and raise hand, and I ask this, I ask, so NCO bought it. Their open date is today. How long can they report it? And almost everybody in the class says, well, seven years. They just opened it today. No, that is not what federal law says at all. In fact, they're required under federal law for to have a complete information that third-party collector is supposed to report who the original creditor and account number is so that the system can match it up with the original creditor and purge it at the same time as the original trade line. Once they sell it to a third-party collection, that third-party party collection company is beholden to the same original data delinquency as the original creditor. So, for example, with a medical collection, they are not supposed to report beyond seven years from the first 30-day missed payment with the doctor or the hospital, or the radiation clinic, or whoever. That's all they're allowed to report under law. Now, if I could see a show of hands in here, I would, I would ask, uh, how many of you think collection companies follow that? Or how many think even 1% of collection companies follow that law? And hopefully I wouldn't see any hands, because they don't. Not only that, not only are they not supposed to report beyond seven years of the original data delinquency with the original creditor, but there should only, at any point in time, be one third-party collection for any debt. So if Chase had sold it to Asset Acceptance, who sold it to West Asset Management, who sold it to NCO, as they, those third-party collections sold it, they were supposed to delete their trade line under federal law. So when Asset Acceptance sold it to West Asset Management, they should have deleted their trade line. Now, again, I would say, so nobody in here has seen that. 
and I wouldn't, hopefully I wouldn't see any hands because that happens all the time where they leave on those trademarks. And the original creditor is not blameless here either. When they sell it, well, how's this? The information on your credit report has to be 100% accurate, complete, and verifiable. How many times does the consumer owe the debt? Just once. When that original creditor sells it to third-party collection, they're required under federal law to change to their status to transfer and the balance to zero. They cannot report a balance when there's a third-party collection that actually is, that owns that debt and is reporting that balance. <laughs> So that's how they mess up a lot is by not closing it, by not showing zero bonds. And also it's worth noting here as well that third-party collections, by definition, are closed accounts. When you see them reporting as installments or open accounts, that's illegal as well. If you've ever seen a third-party collection that had a late payment on it, that's illegal. It was already closed and charged off when they bought it. You can't go delinquent on an already charged off account. All of these issues tie back into all the lawsuits that have originated from ODD, okay? So that's, uh, and also, well, real quick, date of last activity. Date of last activity on a mortgage report, and this is one of those other myths and misconceptions, what's better, a mortgage report or a consumer report? Most consumers, and probably most of you think, well, the mortgage report, it's got scores on it. And consumers think it because it's the only time they really get to see a score that's actually used for lending purposes. But the truth is, the consumer report is better by definition. Federal law requires 100% disclosure of all the information contained in your consumer credit file on a consumer report, not necessarily on a mortgage report. And in the case of date of last activity, if you go look at your consumer report right now, go look at pull, go to Experian.com and pull your report and look at it. You're not going to see date of last activity on there. It doesn't exist. It's not Metro 2 coding. There's lots of dates on there, open date, closed date, charged off date, uh, last paid date, last reported date. But date of last activity is not there. Date of last activity is something that the Bureau creates after the score is created. Think about it. The Bureau pulls the raw data from the Super Credit Reporting Agency. They score that data, and then they merge those three things together, create a date of last activity and all the other dates, and try to put them together into one cohesive file. But the scores are created before DLA. Now, ODD is something that does go into credit scoring. It is true that as time progresses, as we get closer to that seven-year mandatory deletion point, the amount that it's negatively impacting the score decreases. Okay, that is true, if they're reporting it accurately, of course. Uh, but date of last activity, it can be ODD, it could be the charge-off date, it could be the last pay date. There is no Metro 2 standard for date of last activity. So it's not, can't possibly be in a score. I mean, there's, everything in a score can be expressed mathematically. Oh, since date of last activity doesn't even have a clear definition, it could be the closed date, like Sarah, the ODD or the paid date or, or any of these things. If you can't define it, then you can't put parameters on it and you can't express it mathematically. The reason that date of last activity seems to impact the score is because every now and then it is a date that impacts the score, like original date of delinquency. But that's just coincidence. It's not data last activity impacting it. It's original data delinquency impacting it. Okay. So, hey, Eric, you still there, bud? Yep, I'm here. All right, guys, we're going to get to the Q and A section momentarily. Um, there was actually a couple of really good questions up here that I wanted you to hit on, and it, it kind of goes to exactly what you were just finishing up on, James. Uh, one was the the issue about is it legal or appropriate for a collection company to mark you as delinquent if a person has not agreed to a payment plan with the collection company? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They, marking you delinquent from a third-party collection company is a violation of at least five different fundamental concepts of credit reporting. Do we, Eric, I'm sorry. What I was going to ask, but do you, want, do you want me to do some of the Q&A right now, or do you want to do the closing part, and then I'll stick around as long as I need to to get the answers to these questions, everybody. Well, I think there were a few that I wanted you to go through uh, as, as okay. I went through this. I'll tell you what, guys. One of the reasons that I asked James onto the program, um, although you may or may not be aware of this, guys, but one of the things that uh, that I've asked James to do is to fill in the details on some of these things. So I definitely wanted you guys to have something. Like, for example, one of the things I was thinking about in this respect is, is okay, so James, there's a number of questions on here about how do you help people get these things fixed. 
So, mm -hmm. like, for example, uh, everybody on the call, uh, as you're thinking about, like, one of the examples James gave a few minutes ago about original data delinquency or, or data last activity. So what do you do, for example, with a, um, a third-party collection company that's incorrectly being reported? How, what is the best or most effective way for us or a, you know, a consumer to dispute that uh, collection that they let's say okay so let's take a typical loan scenario here they've got a, a five hundred dollar uh, underneath balance on a charge off that was sold to a third party collection company uh, they go to pay that off because underwriting told them they had to pay it off to qualify sure. for the loan now all of a sudden the the account is being reported where the um, where the it looks like the open date is two months ago you know or the date that they pay it so now all of a sudden their scores drop from a six fifty to a 580, right? right? It's going to blow the loan out of the water. Now we know it's being inaccurately reported. How do you get it corrected? Okay, a couple things on that. First of all, just to make everybody on the call nice and angry at the collection companies, <laughs> uh, how many times has everybody on here had a scenario like what we're talking about here where they pulled the report the first time and the collection wasn't there? And then when they pulled it at closing, there was a new collection that had popped up that stopped, that held up the closing and, uh, and created a problem. I can tell you right now the reason that happened is because of trigger leads. Third party collection companies will actually put a skip trace on the consumer to save a little bit of cash instead of, um, instead of actually reporting it because they're paying the report based on the volume of data that they're reporting. So instead of doing that, uh, they will put a skip trace on that person. And what they're looking for, what their trigger is, is a mortgage lead. So, because they know, just like you said, to pay it through, and to pay it at closing, pay it through escrow, they know that there's a good chance. There's a high probability that they will get paid by reporting that collection on someone who's just applied for a mortgage. So that is a deliberate uh, tactic that they use for collection purposes that I'm sure upsets some of the people on this call. Uh, and, uh, gosh, I, that webcam I saw, oh, sorry I've leaned forward so many times, you get to see my notes here, I think, geez. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but... Uh, Going back to how we would deal with it, I mean, for, for our purposes, um, obviously you don't want to just address the third-party collection companies. You want to address the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the credit reporting agencies. You also want to address the third-party collection company. But the problem that we've seen our customers encounter before coming to us, unfortunately, is that third-party collection companies will take the money and then go ahead and re-portfolio the debt and sell it. Uh, you know, so if a consumer, uh, you know, obviously that is something we can assist with and we'd love to, it's, you know, CRA Credit Services, we'd love to help with that if the consumer wants to do it on their own. They certainly do want to address any errors that are in the reporting with the credit reporting agencies and the collection companies directly. If they are going to pay it, they want to get it in writing uh, beforehand. Uh, there is nothing illegal about the collection company agreeing in writing to delete it. Sometimes they will say that that is illegal. It is not. Fair Credit Reporting Act states if you choose to report it. You choose to report. It's expensive to report to a credit reporting agency. There's lots of collection companies and credit unions and finance companies that don't report anything to a credit reporting agency. You don't have to. If you choose to, the information you report must be 100% accurate, complete, and verifiable. There's nothing wrong with them agreeing to accept payment in, ex in exchange for deletion. Uh, just you want to make sure you have all of that in writing with a signature on letterhead if, if you agree to it or you can, your customers agree to it. Uh, the other option that you have if you're going to pay it uh, is to do a restrictive endorsement, and I will tell you just real quick, uh, most people give you improper advice on how to do a restrictive endorsement. Just because you put something on the back of a check saying by cashing this check you agree to delete this off of three credit reporting agencies does not make it a valid contract. Basic contract law. You have to have not only offer and acceptance, but you have to have consideration on both sides of the contract. So in order to get a proper uh, uh, restrictive endorsement, the customer would have to add a little <laughs> something extra into the check. So let's say it's a $500 collection and they have to pay it. If they wrote that check for, say, $520, it has to be something reasonable. It can't just be $500.50. Something that would cover the hard labor cost that collection company is going to have. They're going to have to submit to the Oscar. They're going to have to pay an hourly employee to do so. So put, say, $520, say for the extra $20 included on this check, you're agreeing to submit the paperwork necessary to delete this trade line from all three credit reporting agencies. When they endorse and cash that check, they don't have to, by the way, but if they do cash and endorse that check, that canceled check, that cash check, would be a valid contract where they would offer acceptance and consideration on both sides. So that's bottom line there for a proper restrictive endorsement. You have to think about consideration on both sides of the contract. Awesome, awesome. 
Well, James, I'm going to give you just a quick second here to read through some of the questions that have been submitted so far and let you kind of pick out which one you want. While, uh, while James is doing that, guys, there's one last thing I wanted to introduce you to um, just before we jump off with today's call. But one of the reasons that we asked James to join us for today's program is because of the fact that um, you know, that there's a, there's a great opportunity coming up. Uh, James and I worked together to put together a coach training program about becoming a certified credit coach. And it's what we'll end up doing is it is a five-part web shop series. The sessions run between 60 and 90 minutes. Uh, it, will, it, it will be consecutive Mondays starting at 3 o'clock Central Time, um, starting April 20th. And we'll run the, the, the direct, uh, we'll run just Monday week, uh, for five weeks running. Uh, with that event and what we're going to do is it's going to be a very in-depth very hands-on step-by-step guide on how you can help your clients educate them on better credit management how to uh, eliminate or uh, reduce or the negative score impact of stuff that's being inaccurately reported and also how to be an educator and a recognized certified credit coach in your community so that you and we'll give you tools and resources to go out and do lunch and learns and 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 um, workshops, credit management workshops for, uh, you know, large-scale employers in your area, real estate groups, uh, trade groups, churches, uh, anybody you could work to get in front of a large group of people who want more information about how to more effectively win the credit scoring game. I mean, let's be honest here, guys. Credit scores is, you know, you get positive points for responsible credit behavior, you get negative points for irresponsible credit behavior based on lenders' interpretation of risk. And, and as James has shared with you today, what people don't know or, or don't think about when they use credit is, is what damage that could do to their overall cost of borrowing and all those other kind of things involved. It's a definite area. Uh, it is one of the, probably the most expensive areas of personal finance as far as the amount. Of, I mean, just think about, you know, the couple that has a six, uh, you know, that has a 620 FICO and is paying 22% on their credit card versus the couple that has a, uh, a 680 or 720 and, and they're paying 14%. You know, the difference in cost on a $1,000 balance is several hundred dollars a year. You multiply that times dozens of accounts over dozens of years of a family's life, and that could be a huge barrier for a family achieving their financial goals, such as retirement or college savings for the kids. And as we all know in the mortgage industry, how dependent our industry has become on this little thing called a credit score, which may or may not be in any way, shape, or form an accurate representation of somebody's actual ability to repay a loan or overall risk. Um, so especially when erroneous or, or maliciously reported information is, uh, uh, you know, significantly doing more damage than it should, and that score is no longer an accurate representation of their risk profile, our clients, our customers, our borrowers need to know how to resolve those issues, and that's what this class is going to teach you. Um, so over the course of the five-week program, James is going to go really deep into some of the tactical things that you need to do to help your clients overcome the issues or challenges they're facing, as well as what you need to be able to promote yourself as a certified credit coach and how to get in front of a lot of audiences, dozens if not hundreds of people over the course of the coming year who want and desperately need the valuable information that you're going to be trained to provide them. Uh, the program regularly retails for $497. Um, through the next week, we are offering a $200 discount. If you go to the shopping cart, if you just go to mxlcoach.com slash credit, you can register for the program right now. Uh, if you go and use that promo code CREMAX and all discount code, you know, first select the, the item uh, for the Certified Credit Coach web shop. Uh, training program, and then of course, when it gets to the shopping cart, be sure to type in the CRE Max in all capital letters. Hit the apply button, and that'll reduce it to 297 for the program. I mean, think about it, guys. For just you know, for that little sparse amount of money, I mean, you know, what's your return on investment if you do one additional loan through the guidance and training that James and I are going to give you as part of this training program? I mean, one additional loan would be about a 500% ROI for most loan officers. Um, I mean, I don't know where else in life you can get that kind of a return. Um, but with that being said, um, you know, the, the, if you're interested in finding out more about the program, you can certainly call us or reach out to us at Maximum Acceleration here, and we'll get you the uh, answers to those questions. Otherwise, we'd love to see you as part of that program. Um, this is uh, probably the last time we'll do it in a live event. Um, in a live version, after this point, it will probably be just the pre-recorded version available because it's, it is very time-consuming and it is uh, definitely a, a bit of a challenge to coordinate the logistics of James and I getting this done. Um, you could certainly um, uh, you know, participate, however, um, by going ahead and joining us. 
Uh, with that being said, um, additional questions, comments, James, were you able to find a, a couple that you thought would be really a, a good tie-up for the program here? So just yeah, one you'd like to some comment on? Yep, I got a couple here. So the first one was uh, there was a gentleman that asked uh, about whether they, they changed the dates that they report on a monthly basis to manipulate the score. That actually is a myth. Um, in fact, what federal law has said, uh, particularly for credit cards, uh, since the uh, credit card uh, holder bill of rights was was passed in 2010 uh, is uh, that they actually have to have a fixed date and if they are not going to report on their statement date then they have to have a different field on the credit card statement letting you know the date that they do report to the credit reporting agencies so if you don't see another field on your credit card statement telling you hey we report to experience and in transmission on this date then you can safely assume it's a statement date. Now, here's the problem with that. Um, so what that means is, on the same day that they're creating that sequential data tape that I mentioned, they're also generating your statement and mailing it to you. So if you're one of those dutiful customers that the credit card company said, sure, max it out. We're not going to charge you going over limit. Max it out. Wait for your statement. And when you get it, pay it off. Well, unfortunately, what that means is, at the credit reporting agency level, even though you're paying it off every single month, if you're paying, maybe you're charging up five thousand and five dollars on your five thousand dollar limit, and then you're paying it down to zero every single month. At the credit reporting agency, you're maxed out all the time because they're reporting on your statement date. And since you're waiting for your statement to get to pay it, it's reporting you as totally maxed out over limit, which and that's how it's being factored in the score. But it is nonetheless, it is going on the same date, whatever your statement date is. Most likely, again, in the absence of a different date, that's the date that they're reporting. Gordon, what was that other question, Buck? The one that you have to pull them up? Oh. It, was, it was a short one, but it was a good one. I think you wrote it in a separate thing. Uh, well, let's answer that one while you're looking. Oh, you got it? Oh, disputed account statements. Um, so this is interesting. Um, I know that for desktop underwriter, uh, even the, the resolved dispute statements where it says, you know, account was in dispute, now resolved, consumer disagrees, meets requirements of FCBA or FCRA, I know that those are kicking out and the, the, because there's, a, there's a kind of a, an assumption that since desktop underwriter is kicking those out, that those codes are impacting the score. They don't. There are two different types of dispute codes. And, and actually, the credit reporting agency for Metro 2, uh, they're not called dispute codes. They're either called uh, special uh, special uh, compliance codes, subscriber compliance codes, or consumer compliance codes, CCC. Uh, any of those three don't impact the score. Uh, they're just they're basically statements of continued dispute. But when you think about it, they don't stop you from getting a Kohl's card. They don't stop you from getting a MasterCard. They don't stop you from getting a car. If you could manipulate the score that easily by putting on those dispute codes, the only industry that would be impacted is mortgage. Nobody else cares about them. Clearly, that's not the case. They're not impacting the score. Now, the reason that HUD worries about them, that the GSEs worry about them, is because um, there is a dispute code that does impact the score. During the time frame where an account is actually under investigation, so that's like either 30 or 45 days. And, and by the way, let's define that real quick. Let's say you mail an investigation to the credit reporting agencies. There's mail time, and then they receive it, and they have five business days, business days to process it. So if you've ever heard that, well, mail your disputes around Christmas because they've only got this amount of time, and uh, they, in Christmas they uh, they're not working those days. No, it's business days for the five business days. They they don't have to work on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Five business days to process the mail they receive, and then once they process it, they put it into their system, and it goes through eOscar to the creditor. That's when the 30 calendar days starts to run. And it, in two instances, it can actually be 45 days instead of 30. If you've accessed your free annual report in the last 90 days, this was one of the caveats. They have to give a free report. But if you do an investigation after you get your free report, they have 45 days to respond instead of 30. Likewise, uh, if you send additional information during that 30 days that it's under investigation, they get an additional 15 days. So it does no good to cram them, what, again, what some of the unfortunate, some credit repair as opposed to credit correction, what some credit repair companies do is say, well, we're just going to overwhelm them with letters and they've got to respond. No, actually, 
Obviously, they don't. Once it's on an investigation, you keep sending letters. You're just giving them more and more time to respond. Nonetheless, during that time frame where it's actually under investigation, there are elements of the account that are suppressed. Uh, specifically, the balance history and the payment history are su uh, suppressed from the calculation of the score while the account is actually under investigation. The fact that that happens, basically their system can't differentiate between an XB and an XC dispute code. The XB dispute codes are the ones that are during investigation that suppress important elements of the account for credit scoring purposes. The XC are statements of continued dispute. All the, the desktop underwriter sees is an X dispute code and, and blocks that. Okay. Now, with that said, you can, you can remove dispute codes. It's just, in fact, for us, standard procedure, every one of our clients, we remove all the dispute codes when we're done with the, the program from any accounts that were made. Just because it, they're, you know, at that point, they've either validated, they've done what they're supposed to do, they're not actually in dispute anymore. They don't, they don't you know, it's reported correctly at this point. So we remove those dispute codes. The way that we're able to do it is simply we know what they are. We know that they're consumer compliance codes or subscriber compliance codes. And unfortunately, the credit reporting agencies, their turnover on their dispute agents every year is about 70%. So you've got somebody that's likely been there less than a year that's supposed to understand this, you know, all of these laws and changes and policies that would fill a building of books. And they've been through a 90-day apprenticeship program. They, you, and they didn't come from mortgage. They didn't come from something else. So you say, remove that dispute code. And that person sitting at their desk experience goes, what the heck's a dispute code? But if you say, hey, remove consumer compliance code uh, you know, 2B, they know what that is and they remove it. So. Definitely. All right, guys, I'm going to jump back in here for just one quick second, do a little wrap-up. And I know James has mentioned he's got a few minutes. He can hang around and tackle a couple extra questions. Many of you have been posting a little bit of a quick question about what is maximum acceleration and, and what do we do. Um, we offer three different levels of service from uh, home study course, group coaching programs, on-site training programs, and one-on-one -on -one personal coaching. If you're interested in finding out more about what we do, the best way we've found to help you understand the value of coaching is to actually experience it. We do this through what we call a strategy session, which is a no-cost, no-obligation session for you to have with one of our coaches. Uh, we'll work through a particular challenge or opportunity that you would like to be able to, to, to make some progress on. You'll leave with an action plan, and of course, we'll talk a little bit about when and if it makes sense to pursue coaching a little bit further at that stage. Um, if you want to take advantage of one of those strategy sessions, there are only a handful of them available every week based on the limitations of our coaches' actual schedules, uh, which are pretty full right now, in all honesty. Um, so if you are interested, they are filled on a first-come, first-served basis. If you want to just post that you'd like to have one of those strategy sessions, uh, go ahead and pop that in the Q&A. Give our team the best phone number and email address uh, for uh, connecting with you to coordinate scheduling. Um, last thing I want to do is you guys have all invested a significant amount of time already today in, in joining us for this program, and many of you, I'm sure, are going to want to stay on and get a couple of additional questions answered by James here. Uh, but, you know, the fact of the matter is knowledge is, is only powerful if you use it. And so I want to challenge you to take just a couple of minutes here before you jump into that next phone call or into that next uh, email and, and actually put something in place that's going to help you take action with the information that you've heard today. So the first thing I want you to do is decide when, uh, what was the most valuable thing you heard in the program. Pick one that you want to execute on first. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, you know, it, 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 this is a recorded program. Everybody who's registered and attended uh, today's program is going to receive within about a couple of days, uh, because it does take a little bit of time to reformat the video for streaming. Um, but within a couple of days, you'll receive an email from us with a link to the video. For sure, always welcome to go on to YouTube and search for Maximum Acceleration and subscribe to our channel. That way, you'll automatically get notification as soon as the uh, as soon as the video is posted. But it usually takes our team a couple of days to get the video format. Well, you'll have that to go back to later. So the first thing is, what's the first thing you want to execute on immediately? Secondly, what action do you need to take to make that a part of your daily business from this point forward? Three, put a target date for completion of that action item. You know, next week, next week, Tuesday, or next week, uh, you know, put a specific hard date on by when you want to have that idea in place. Uh, and then, of course, who is going to be your accountability partner? 
you know, one of the things we've learned over the years is that it's kind of the running buddy effect. I mean, think about it from this perspective. You know, let's say I wanted to lose some weight, and it's January 1st for a New Year's resolution, and I decide I want to go out jogging to lose some weight. Okay, so maybe I don't go out January 1st, but, okay, January 2nd, I go and, and I, I push myself further than my physical ability. Uh, January 3rd, I go out, and, uh, and I barely make it around the block. January 4th, I go out, and it's cold, it's wet, and it's nasty outside, and I really every mu muscle in my body aches. I... So I hit the snooze button, roll over, and go back to sleep, right? Never to go jogging again. How different would that be, however, if I had an accountability partner, like a, a neighbor or a, a best friend who said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't we do it together? Well, it's still January 1st. We still pushed it farther than we should have the first couple of days, and, and it's cold and wet and nasty outside. But I know my buddy's going to be on my doorstep at 530. So I get up and go, most likely. That leverage, that accountability, that promise to somebody I know, trust, and respect is a lot harder to break than the promise I make to myself. So find somebody in your life who you trust, who you have respect for, and who is knowledgeable in the areas that you want to grow in your career, and ask them to hold you accountable to following through on the action plans that you've selected today. If there's anything myself or the rest of the team here at Maximum Acceleration can do to help or support you in that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. One of the best things I can think of that you could do for that purpose is join us for the five-part web shop, Becoming a Certified Credit Coach training that James and I are going to be putting on starting April 20th, uh, starting at 3 o'clock uh, Central Time that we'll be going through. Again, remember, you can go directly to the website, mxlcoach.com slash credit, find out a little bit more about the event and the content that will be covered, and then go ahead and register directly through the website using discount code C-R-E-M-A-X, and that will give you that $200 discount. With that being said, James, I know you had mentioned that you were going to be available for just a few more minutes uh, on a couple of additional questions. Um, one of the ones that I'm actually curious to see if, if, we, uh, if you touch on just briefly um, is why does a charge-off show a past due balance based on some of the comments you made earlier? Uh, it, it's going to depend on uh, whether or not it's been sold. Uh, so a charge-off, a lot of people think, well, a charge-off, they're not collecting on it anymore, but that's not accurate. If, they, if a if creditor maintains control of it, they don't sell it to a third-party collection, it is still a past due amount. Charge off is simply an accounting procedure whereby they take it from their accounts receivable and move it into their bad debt file. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's kind of a misconception there that charge off means that uh, they're no longer trying to get that money, and, and that's certainly that, that is not the case. It is, uh, they're so very much want that money, they've just moved it to their bad debt file. So, they do still report that as a past due. Uh, there are some, obviously, there, there are a lot of different uh, scenarios that can be involved there, uh, whether they actually uh, write it off. Uh, to the IRS and, and do a 1099-C, but even in that case, you know, you'll have it where uh, they they rack up past due fees and interest, you know, and they go to a default interest rate on a credit card, 31.99%, um, and let that run for a couple years, and then they write it off, and uh, they actually, you know, write off, let's say it was started off at a couple thousand dollars, now it's sitting at $4,500, uh, and they, uh, they write off 2500 to the IRS and sell the other 2000 to a third-party collection company. They go to a zero balance. At that point, they shouldn't be showing a past due, uh, but that third-party collection company can still uh, attempt to collect on the rest of that, uh, that money. So a charge-off very much is still a past due balance. Um, another one that was up here was uh, FTB Collections Franchise Tax Board. Uh, a couple of things on that. There are actually three different ways that a, a, a franchise tax uh, can show up on a credit report. Uh, if, it, if they're employing a third-party collection company to collect on it and they report, they can only report for the seven years from the original date of delinquency just like any other creditor. However, franchise taxes can also be a judgment. Uh, any judgment on your credit report, public records are a little bit different than uh, the normal trade lines. Uh, there's only three types of public records that will show up on a consumer credit report, liens, judgments, and bankruptcies. As I said earlier, there's only three types of bankruptcies that should be on a consumer report. Liens can be any type of lien. It can be franchise tax liens. It can be IRS liens. It can be state, county, city. Uh, actually, it can even be mechanics liens or contractor liens. So any type of lien can show up on a consumer credit report. And then obviously judgments. So if the franchise tax board sued you and got a judgment against you, that judgment can stay on file from seven years from the date that the judgment was rendered, even if they renew it. So, for example, we're in Texas, and Texas 
uh, domestic judgments, 10 years with 10 years renewable. So theoretically, you can owe that money for 20 years if they renew it at the 10-year mark, but still, it can only report for that original seven years to your credit report. That's the only time it's considered uh, as relevant credit information, okay? Uh, then the other side of it is, for franchise taxes, they can report as a lien. Uh, believe it or not, there is no federal standard. Liens theoretically could report forever. However, CDIA standards and what all the credit reporting agencies file uh, uh, follow is 15 years that they can stay on file for an unpaid lien, uh, and that's 15 years from the date the lien was filed. Now, what federal law does say is that it's the only type of trade line that does this. Liens, when you pay them, they stay on file seven years from the date they were paid. So if it's been 14 years and 11 months and you pay it, it will stay on file for seven years longer than that. So theoretically, the maximum amount of time that a lien can stay on your credit report is 21 years. Let's see, what other ones do we have? So the question is, if an original creditor reports charge off, but the third party collection collects, is the, original, is the original creditor required to report paid? Uh, yes, they are. They're, they're, when they, as soon as they sell, actually, they're required to report paid as soon as they sell it, whether the collection company collects or not. Once they no longer retain ownership, and that, that uh, there was another question about factoring companies, and the same laws, the same policies are going to apply whether the uh, whether the the debt is being portfolioed or being factored. Uh, let me explain that real quick. There's basically two. At, you know, just again, at the 36,000 foot level, there's, there's two types of collections. There's factored collections, which is where I've essentially hired a third party company to come in and collect for me, but I'm retaining ownership of the debt. Typically, uh, you know, that's less risk for the collection company, but also less reward. Uh, and then there's portfolio, where I'm chased and I've got $100 million of charged off debt, and I just take the whole thing and I sell it for $15 million to NCO, and NCO takes the risk. Spend a 15 million, but they'd also they can collect however much of it that they can. Uh, so there's more reward there as well. So there's that's just it, you know, again 36 thousand foot level. That's two types of collections, and they're both going to report the exact same way. Once they no longer, once the original creditor is no longer actively trying to collect, and they are not, they they've gone, given it to someone else. They should be showing transferred zero balance. Now, so every every trade line, every non-public record trade line has both a status and a condition. Status is what is it right now? Condition is what is the worst status that that trade line has had in the last seven years. So if you're 60 days past due right now, but three years ago you actually got up to 90 days past due and then brought it current, the status would be 60 days past due and the condition would be 90 days past due. You would see that expressed on Experian Consumer Report as 60 was 90. Okay. Uh, so every every account has that. So on that transferred account, transferred and closed is the status but the condition would be charge off. So there would still be a notation of charge off there, but it would be a condition, not what it is right now. What else? I gotta be able to read this word. Click on it for me, highlight it please. Okay. All right, guys. Well, he's looking for the next question to answer. Just a reminder, uh, again, folks, that if you really do want to learn how to take this to the next level in your business and be the recognized credit expert in your field and in your community, which puts you in front of literally dozens of borrowers on a regular basis for an educational purpose, uh, come join us for the Certified Credit Coaching, Becoming a Certified Credit Coach web shop. It's a five-part series uh, for for as little as 297, you can get access to the program, and James will walk you through step by step how to manage these issues and how to become the recognized expert in your credit field. We'll also give you the packet of information you can use to go out and market yourself as a certified credit coach with some lunch and learn program templates that you can use and, and tools and resources that are going to help you uh, really uh, get yourself in front of a lot of people, provide a very valuable education, and then go uh, from there. Um, let's see, if you have a, a client who's in need of your company's services, what is the process and what could they expect to spend to repair their credit? Um, James, go ahead and if you wouldn't mind, obviously CRE Credit Services, your company, uh, does help and support originators in working with borrowers if, if you as a, as a loan officer do not have the time or, or it's not honestly your highest and best use to do credit repair or credit coaching with your clients. Um, James, what does your company offer and how do they contact you? Absolutely. Uh, well, what they would want to do is, uh, uh, actually, we're going to reach out to you guys as well, but 
uh, what they would want to do is call in and, and speak with uh, Yolanda or Gordon, and uh, they would uh, get you all the information on how to refer. Uh, as far as pricing goes, uh, we've got a matrix based on the amount of, uh, of errors that we find on a report. Um, starts at uh, uh, $599. Uh, for most people applying for mortgage, the maximum they would be they would be spending is $999. Uh, certainly, uh, I know that that doesn't make us the cheapest, but when you look at someone like, for example, Lexington Law, and uh, Lexington Law, I'm not speaking ill of them, I know them, uh, I know the, uh, the founders of them, and they, uh, they, they have their purpose, but they'll tell you straight away that they would like for people to stay in their program forever, and their program is $99 down, $99 a month, and average 26 months. So you're going to live with poor credit for a lot longer, and uh, which obviously we all know costs a lot of money. And twenty six hundred dollars. <laughs> and twenty six hundred dollars. So it's uh, yeah. you know we're in the state of Texas. We have everything that we're going to charge somebody has to be charged uh, in a six month time frame. Uh, so our you know unfortunately ours is a little bit more expensive during the program. We do have to abide by federal law as well, where we cannot charge until we've done the work. As far as the program itself, what a, an originator can expect. Uh, obviously, for their customer, it's excellent customer service, 24/7 online support. Uh, they're going to get updates to both the client and the originator uh, every uh, 45 days, showing what the changes in the consumer score, the advice we've given to the consumer, what they've done, uh, what the uh, how many corrections have been accomplished with each of the three credit reporting agencies, uh, and uh, you know our best estimate as to how much longer they have in the program and uh, when it's uh, you know. When is going to be the best time to pull back? Uh, like I said earlier, there won't be won't be littered with dispute codes. Uh, also, we're never going to do anything to uh, to impugn your integrity. I don't lie. I do not tell lies to credit reporting agencies. I look for actual errors, actual misreporting, uh, errors under the Fair Credit Billing Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Uh, every state has its own Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Unfortunately. Collection companies love to violate deceptive trade practices, and that could be like, for example, an apartment collection. Uh, they love to not return deposits, not credit them for their deposits, and then charge them for things like, you know, even though the agreement said we're not going to replace the carpet and you won't have to replace when you move out, and then you get charged <laughs> to replace the carpet when you move out. Well, that's a deceptive trade practice, and having that balance on your credit report is impacting you illegally. Uh, so those are the type of things that we're looking for, actual violations of state and federal law, uh, getting those corrected for your clients. and. Uh, making you look good and making the consumer look to you the way that they should look. We don't want to misrepresent their risk. We want to show them as the appropriate risk that they actually are. You know, most of our clients, uh, you know, I, I understand, you know, I, I happen to be an optimist, uh, but at the same time I recognize there are people out there that just don't pay their bills. They don't, I don't want them to get a mortgage with you. Uh, they don't need a mortgage. Now, I, we always give 100% free consultation. So even if it's somebody that we're not going to be able to help, we're going to give them good education, good advice, some of the same stuff we've talked about here. Tell them how to manage their credit cards. Tell them they do need credit cards. Tell them they do need installment. They need a mix of credit to start building a good credit profile. They need to keep everything current. And guess what? One day past the due date is 30 days past the due date. And, uh, you know, you get that all the time. Well, I was only five days late, and it says I was 30 days late. Yeah, you were past the due date. 30 actually means one to 30 days past due. You know, 60 means 31 to 60 days past due. It's two cycles past due. So yeah. Educating them on things like that that's, you know, uh, real world examples of how to uh, properly manage their credit. You know, one of our other key principles yeah. is don't want repeat customers. So <laughs> we want to educate them so that once they're done, they can, so they can get them on and move, move, move them down the road, right? Right. right. So, James, uh, how, do, how do they actually contact you? What website, uh, what phone number Absolutely. to contact uh, your team? Gordon? My, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is Yolanda Martinez, and my personal self. Is 972-822-0486. Gordon Moore's day. 817-566-5731. And let me make sure I got that right. 817-566-5131. 5731. 5731. Okay, great. Guys, and if you would, uh, if you want to go ahead and post, like if there's a company phone number that routes that uh, or whatever, and uh, as well as the website, what's the what's the website to go to for people to check out more? www.crecreditservices.com. And also, that's uh, I've got a whole lot. I've got piece. I think probably about 
200 uh, blog entries on there. We've got lots of articles I've written that have been published all over the place. There's a, a, a wealth of additional information on there as well. Uh, it doesn't go into quite as much detail as we will in the uh, in, for the certified credit coach, but uh, but still, there's because we've got to write. Obviously, what we put on our website's got to be there for consumers. And you guys are mortgage pros. You you go into a little bit more depth certainly than uh, than the general consumer on the street. So, uh, but that's uh, but there, nonetheless, there's a lot of good information, and you're more than welcome if you find something on there that you think would be good for uh, for your customers to take that and uh, uh, and uh, share it. And that's uh, you know whatever you want to use it for for sure. Uh, and absolutely. Uh, real, real quick here, if you want to answer this one, uh, there, this is a good question. I don't get asked this one much actually, but it, it's fantastic. Uh, said, is there a differential score uh, for settled, uh, settled for less than balance versus paid in full? It's interesting. You would think that there would be, but there's not. There is no dip. settled, transferred, paid, or all the same status. Uh, however, what causes and why you see that happen is what led up to the settlement. Technically, whenever you settle an account, there is an associated charge off with it. Whatever the remaining balance is, yeah, they forgave it. They're not trying to collect it anymore, but they did write off some money when you settled that account. So it's not the settle that would impact you. It's the charge off. Or if it was, you know, a lot of times with settlement, let's be honest, you can get settlements on, on an account that's never been late in circumstances, um, you know, a family fraud or something like that. We see that a lot. Uh, but usually it's actually the payment history that led up to the charge off that's causing the score differential, not the actual, uh, or led up to the settlement, I should say, that's causing the score differential, not the settlement itself. Settlement, set, like I say, settle in full for less than the full balance for scoring purposes is the same as paid in full. It's the payment history that led up to it and the subsequent charge off, if they report it that way, that caused the differential at score. Awesome, awesome. Well, James, it's always great having you on the program. Um, definitely looking forward to this next round of the uh, Certified Credit Coaching web, cl web Shop class. I'm going to have to hop off of here because um, I need to get ready for my next coaching session. Um, you're welcome to hang around if you want and, and address some of these questions. Make sure you, you go ahead and uh, grab the uh, the save it down on your guys' end uh, so that you can yeah. follow up with these guys. I know there's a number of folks in here who had asked for information about joining the Certified Credit Coaching class uh, as well as also about potentially working with you to help their customers kind of outsourcing to you um, uh, in that respect. Um, you know, guys, one of the things, and I guess this is kind of a, the final thought I'd like to leave with you, at least for me anyway, is remember that, that there's a, there's a reason that we are very selective here at Maximum Acceleration and who we promote. Um, we want to work with the highest caliber of, of third-party service providers um, like CRE Credit Services. And, and uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet this uh, organization in depth. I've done a tremendous amount of due diligence with them. And they have the highest integrity and they operate with the most ethical and most uh, morally uh, connected process. And, and I guess my final thought here is be cautious. Uh, especially in the area of credit repair. I mean, like, for example, if you, if you have a borrower who's working with a credit repair company and they, for example, omit uh, because of, of using a manipulative or, or deceptive practice, they omit a significant balance on a charge-off that then they close a loan and that charge-off then gets perfected into a judgment or lien that gets placed against the property um, and, and ends up defaulting on the mortgage, you could be legally culpable um, as a result. and I mean that, in essence, you know, the, you know, the, the, I guess the final thing about it is think about the definition of loan fraud. Okay, knowingly and willfully misreporting information for the purpose of obtaining a loan is the legal definition of loan fraud. So be very cautious about any potential credit repair company or credit whatever company that says they can delete anything for any purpose for any reason because you may be exposing yourself as an originator to risk and and you know when it comes to your livelihood is that something you really want to put on the line at the end of the day you know helping somebody uh, you know misreport credit information for the purpose of obtaining a loan is it really in their best interest anyway to to help them get into a home they really can't afford so just a word of caution there if you're working with services not like CRE credit services one of the reasons I highly recommend CRE is because they do it right and that's a big part of why we've selected them as preferred provider and we uh, ask them as frequent guests on this forum uh, 
So with that being said, guys, I'm going to go ahead and hop off of here. Um, any other questions, suggestions, or comments, uh, feel free to follow up with us. You can always reach us at info at mxlcoach.com. Again, if you'd like to take advantage of one of the strategy sessions, uh, just go ahead and post in the Q&A that you'd like to take advantage of that. Um, uh, best phone number and email address, and we'll be able to, uh, my team will follow up with you for scheduling for one of those strategy sessions. Wish you a great week, guys, and hope to see you on, on future events in, in the webinar series. Thanks, Eric. Hey, I'm going to answer one last question here that we've got up here. So I'll, you can, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up. All right, so the last one that we had here that I, that I don't think we've answered was about uh, trigger leads. And I think that uh, what, we, what you guys are referring to when you say trigger leads is when uh, you pull, uh, you get a lead on a customer, uh, pull their credit report, and all of a sudden they're getting contacted by LendingTree and uh, uh, all these other banks and stuff, and I, I know I know that is so frustrating for you. You've gone out, you've done the advertising, you've done the legwork and the networking and talked to the realtors and you pull a report and all of a sudden you're getting challenged. And uh, I wish I could tell you that there's a good answer for why it's legal. It just, uh, it's a way that the credit reporting agencies make a lot of money. And the best way to tell you, I, I worked with them myself, obviously, and, and uh, they've got really, really expensive lobbyists. <laughs> it's unfortunately the best answer I can give you. There, there's just they make enough money off it, and they uh, uh, they've lobbied for it enough that that is uh, uh, that's just is what it is. So uh, I think are we good, Gordon? All right. So you guys have our web address. You've got cell phones. I'm gonna give you as well. Uh, Gordon's email address is g meek g m e e k at c r e repair dot com. Yolanda's is Y Greer, Y G R E E R, at C R E Repair.com. You've got their cell phones, you've got our, our uh, website. Uh, if you ever need anything from me, my direct email is James at C R E Credit Services, all one word, dot com. So, again, thank you guys so much. We appreciate uh, everybody coming on the call today. And uh, if uh, we'll leave the, uh, I'm going to leave the session open for a little bit here so that if anybody has any more questions or anything, enter them in and we'll uh, email you back and uh, uh, get you an answer to them. So uh, thanks again and have a wonderful rest of the day.